Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Kathy, and today we're going to be testing out a brand new watercolor set, Paul Rubens's new line of professional watercolor products. They were kind enough to offer me a set in exchange for an honest opinion, and I've been testing them out in bits and pieces and seeing what they're made of. If you're new, I do art process videos and essay style videos where I talk about my creative process and generally ramble too much about one thing or another. So be sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell to get alerts and colorful videos like this in the future. Let's get to it! This is Paul Rubens's fourth generation artist grade watercolors, and as of now, they only offer two ranges, one with 24 color tubes and the other with 36, and both in five milliliter tubes. Um, the one I'm testing out today is the 24 color set. So the brand boasts two main qualities with their set. First, that most of the paints are composed of single pigments, which is a big plus in watercolor because it's a medium in which you're constantly mixing and blending and layering while still trying to maintain a bit of transparency. And secondly, affordable pricing. They are, in fact, notably cheaper than the bigger juggernaut brands that have artist grade attached to them. But as we know, price isn't always a linear indication of quality or personal preference. So we're going to dive in and explore the paints and see where they land. Every color they offer within the yellow to red range is very vivid and fine. I was pleasantly surprised to see Naples yellow included here, because it's a color I've really fallen in love with in the last year or so, and have been using it pretty much non-stop, especially in portrait paintings. It's only one of two paints in the set that has three pigments, which is to be expected. Naples yellow is always a combination of three pigments, white included. Other than that, I found the yellows and the reds a pleasure to work with. They're very transparent and mix easily and cleanly with other paints, and I really like the range of the reds they included here. Although I would have preferred another warm red alongside cadmium red light, because cadmium red is slightly granulating and also opaque. Also, it's interesting and rather strange, frankly, how Kinochrodon maroon looks more like a Kinochrodon rose. Kind of blindingly bright and rosy. And this Kinochrodon rose looks a lot more muted than it would be in other palettes. I had to check several times to make sure I didn't mix them up, so I don't know. It's just an odd difference. But for the most part, I think this is a solid selection of reds. I did a couple of test sketches of fruits using the yellows and reds, so this is mostly lemon yellow, cadmium yellow deep, kinochrodon rose, french blue, with some white gouache. You can get a pretty intense and rich result with these yellow reds, making them perfect as underpaintings when you want that deep sun glow to show through the rest of your work.
with the blues, we pretty much have all the basics. French blue, which is French ultramarine, Pothalo blue, or Pothalo blue, because having at least one random French word always elevates the name, Berlin blue, translucent turquoise, and indigo. And Berlin blue is the same as Prussian blue. So here is a small pet peeve I have. I understand from a marketing perspective the need to assign unique sounding names to paints, to separate yourself from the competition. And I admit it's always exciting to scan through a color chart and see names like Shire Green and Galaxy Pink. But if 80% of your basic colors have the same name as the basic colors in other brands, then why have the remaining 20% be different? It just makes it confusing. Like calling burnt sienna aged dragon's blood. It sounds awesome, but at the end of the day, if it walks and talks like burnt sienna, it's still a burnt sienna. But anyway, back to the blues. The blues do what they say on the tin. They're vivid and rich, they're good mixers, and there are no unpleasant surprises you have to deal with. A few notable things. The French blue is not as granulating as some other brands. Indigo is on the grayer end of the spectrum and resembles more Payne's gray. And translucent turquoise isn't as fluorescent as it's showing up on camera here. It's deeper and a lot more muted. With the greens, we have May green and Oriental green as basics. They're both very transparent and bright and not really intended to be used on their own, but are well suited for mixing. Oriental green, good old PG7, is again definitely not as fluorescent as you're seeing on camera. Now here is where my love for this palette lies. Everything you see from Cobalt Turquoise Dark to Venetian Red. These rich, muted earth and forest colors are my favorites of the set. This grouping is also the most opaque, although it claims that earth yellow is only partly so. When painted, it looks completely opaque. Cobalt Turquoise Dark is a heavily granulating grayish green that resembles lichen. It's kind of comparable to Cascade Green in Daniel Smith, except this one is made with a single pigment. It looks gorgeous on its own, and when used lightly, there's a misted, grassy field in autumn look to it. And when mixed, particularly with yellow and red toned paints, it helps create some stunning, rusted results. Olive Green Dark is a very rich jade green that looks pretty if a bit too vibrant on its own, but when mixed, you can achieve some lovely, more realistic looking greens. Earth Yellow is Yellow Ochre. I've had bad experiences with opaque yellow ochres in the past because it's a color that I used often for portraits, and layering lots of opaque paints on top of each other is a quick recipe for mud. 
But lately, I've been pushing my style away from the super transparent um, toward one that's a little more solid because those are the types of watercolor paintings that really speak to me. The richness and depth they have juxtaposed with watercolor's fluidity. So this is a yellow ochre that I'm going to play around with some more because I really do love the color, this beaten down, baked desert kind of look. And the burnt sienna. You know how much I love my burnt siennas. And this is a kind that I adore with a lovely orange glow emanating from it. It is composed of two pigments, and you can kind of see the flecks of black separating out in the granulation. Venetian red is a more clay-looking version of burnt sienna, also slightly granulating but more opaque and muted. I am not exaggerating when I say that I truly can't get enough of these colors. There's just something about them that I want to bottle up tight and keep safe for rainy days. Bottom line, they make me happy. Moving on, we have the final couple of paints. The brown umber is a sapia, the other three pigment color in the set, with a slightly greenish undertone. And there's ivory black, which is your basic ivory black. Now it's very much worth noting that sap green and burnt umber are missing in this range. Sap green isn't a color that everyone uses, and if you mix most of your mid-tone greens, you're probably not going to bemoan its absence. But it's still considered a basic color, and a widely used and useful paint to have in your palette. And it's kind of a given that it would be included in a set that contains 24 colors. So that's a little eyebrow raising. Now, not including sap green is one thing, but the absence of burnt umber is an undeniable misstep in my opinion. Burnt umber is a universal mixer and can be combined with pretty much everything and can be used in a wide variety of subjects. And I really don't understand how it can be taken out of a set as varied as this. I like Venetian red very much, but as a second PR 101 paint, it's superfluous and it really has no business being in the place of burnt umber. And as there's currently no way of purchasing individual paint tubes, simply getting burnt umber separately on the side isn't an option. So here are some test sketches that I did with the paints, messing around with a bunch of the colors. These are the ones that made it through the gauntlet. For the bird, I used a mix of Naples yellow, yellow ochre, Cunacordon rose, and French blue. And for these fruits that you saw me painting earlier, I used the yellow reds and French blue. Overall, I have to say, I was genuinely surprised by the quality of this set. Pretty paints that look pretty on their own are plenty and easy enough to find on the market. But pretty paints that retain their vibrancy and allow for depth after rounds of mixing and glazing is the separation between decent starter paints and professional paints. And this definitely occupies more of the latter. Not once did I feel that the paints were a notable downgrade from the ones that I normally use. They produced fine and vibrant washes, bringing a predictable, comfortable, and easily controlled element to my painting sessions. There are definitely a few niggles. Some of the paint choices, while interesting and unexpected, seem poor replacements for the more basic paints that should be included in a set like this. I also don't know how well the colors will survive long term, so that's something to monitor. And I do wish they would offer 50 milliliter tubes. 
5 milliliter is so small for a basic set and I used them up so quickly, but I suppose it's a way of keeping the pricing relatively low. And who knows, it might be something they have in line for the future. All in all, if you're looking for good quality paints outside of the mainstream products that's not going to break your bank account, this is a great bang for your buck. And that is it for today. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care of yourself, take care of your box of sheep, and I'll see you in the next one.